Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversations with Tyler. Today, I'm here in New York City with Masaki Suzuki. Masaki Suzuki is one of the greatest musical creators and producers of our time. He has recorded the entire set of Bach Sacred Cantatas, which in my collection amounts to, I think, 55 compact discs. He has recorded all of the secular cantatas. These are generally acknowledged to be the most important and best recordings of Bach's cantatas music ever. He is recording uh, complete the organ music of Bach, so he also is a world-class organist, and is recording the complete harpsichord music of Bach, <laughs> uh, works that are commonly acknowledged to be in the top tier. So there's simply no one else I know of with this kind of record of production and quality and dedication and inspiration. Uh, he also has recorded a good deal of Mozart, Handel, many other 18th century composers. He founded the Bach Collegium Japan in 1990. He teaches also as a professor at Yale University and does many other things as well. Masaki Suzuki, welcome. Thank you for your invitation. It's a really great pleasure to come here. I have many questions for you, but to start with Bach, St. John's Passion, 1724. If you had to explain to us in its most fundamental sense, what was new in St. John's Passion that Bach did? What was the nature of that innovation? Well, uh, probably no one expected at the time to have a that dramatic passion, because the passion tradition of the the, the based on derived from the the reading the Bible in the, in the liturgy, so it um, probably the, firstly it was only thought as to Bible reading, but but not, not simply reading instead of that a citation, so with uh, some tones. So the that. Uh, was developed to the music, passion music. And by the time of Bach, uh, that was already developed as a kind of oratorio passion. So that was actually the very um, dramatic experience already. But the still Bach's time on the on the one week before the Easter, this, uh, the passion of the... Uh, Johann Walter was still performed. That means really only F major accord from the beginning until the end, you know, the, to, just to uh, recite the old Bible texts and so on. That was still performed. So the, the very first passion of Bach, uh, in the Leipzig time was the St. John passion, which was a really shocking experience for everyone, I thought. And in terms of choral work, what is new in that passion? Choral work? Yes. Uh, yes, that is a very uh, well. The the structure um, the, the consists of the choir and the, the, as the turba, so, so the the mass of people, uh, the shouting and so on. At the same time, the choir uh, was also supposed to sing the choral, and so the multi functions all the time choral. And do you think of Saint John's Passion as a Christian work, or you conduct it as a Lutheran work, or Drawing from a particular gospel, how do you think about that theologically? Uh, well, uh, from my point of view, yes, Saint John Passion, we are doing this work uh, as uh, the as uh, the just a simple general sacred music, sacred uh, the work, and uh, we are performing this music n not in the liturgy anymore and uh, we are doing in in the concert so that's uh, there are plenty of way of to uh, accept or receive or the the uh, appreciate this music so this uh, um, we are doing simply as the musicians you know to to do our best you know to to uh, uh, to do the sound wise and text wise everything that as good as possible so the i think uh, the music can work afterwards to the individuals you know the according to their situation or thoughts and your own background is calvinist does that in any way shape how you approach uh, the work yeah that is, <laughs> is really 
Good question, actually. I, I, I was asked very many times, why, why are you not Lutheran? <laughs> But there's almost a kind of predestination in the work. Jesus seems to of know course, what's coming course, yeah. more than in other parts exactly, of the Bible. Exactly, yes. So I actually, I, I'm very grateful to be a Calvinist because the, the Calvin uh, was probably the uh, well. I don't know. I, I'm not no theologian. I'm no historian. But still, the I, according to my uh, the knowledge is Calvin was one of the first uh, uh, reform reformation uh, reformator the uh, who acknowledged the, the value of the, the activity and culture of this world, not only in that world in heaven. So. <clears throat> I think uh, the, uh, the it is very often said Calvin uh, uh, was not so uh, the the uh, sim- sim- sympathy for, for, for to the music or culture or whatever, but that is not true. And uh, he has limited uh, the congregational singing only for the psalm, uh, but uh, the. Uh, other than church, at the outside of the church, he has uh, helped some uh, uh, quite much cultural activity. For example, publish of the psalm thing or arrangements and so on. So that uh, he was also helpful to to uh, you know uh, the uh, inspire the the, the act- musical activity in this world. So I think uh, uh, in this way we can uh, evaluate the old uh, musical or whatever cultural activity in this world. Uh, the other kind of uh, under the very big notion as a general grace of the God. So when Bach is in Curtin, in what is now, what was East Germany, mm. uh, which was Calvinist at the time, yeah, but he's exactly. composing mainly secular works. How do you frame that? Well, why did he do that? Oh, that's uh, that he didn't have a chance to compose any. Uh, Lutheran cantata at that time, so he was really uh, well. He uh, w- from from one side he must have been very happy to compose uh, the organ works, the instrumental works, and also secular cantatas and so on. Uh, but probably he uh, wished uh, to do m- more work to the Lutheran Lutheran world, the Lutheran Church, and so on. That's why he uh, uh, moved to to Leipzig, I think. So let's go back and just talk about your career, your history a bit. So you're you're 12 years old, and all of a sudden you hear Karl Richter's recording of Bach's B minor math. <laughs> yeah. H- how did you come upon that, and and how did you feel at the time? Well, that was a really, uh, yeah, that's a little stupid. But uh, the well, I was very very excited, not only with that music, but also I got the quite big stereo equipment stereo equipment from my father and then I was very excited to listen to <laughs> whatever with the headphone headphone was also a very first experience and uh, uh, and the, anyway that's uh, the B man was the so fantastic so wonderful but I didn't understand anything from the text or <laughs> from the music that music was much too complicated and the only thing is the i played quite much trumpet in the brass band so that's why um the the trumpet playing in the that were I, the, by the german trumpeter the adolf scherbaum that was really fascinating in the b manama so i i actually repeat repeatedly listen to the only Gloria. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, but anyway, that uh, B. Manamas uh, is really w- the, the, uh, the wonderful encounter with the Bach's music. Mm. And how is your musical ear back then? So the Richter recording, I think of it as a little bit a mix of overblown and stiff, even though it's pretty good, right? No, it's yeah. not what people would listen to now. Did you have a sense of that back then, and you, or you just yes. blown away? No, no, no. Yeah, well, the, for for other interviews, I have uh, uh, listened back to to that recording <laughs> <laughs> recently, and uh, that was completely different. And well, it is not acceptable at all for, for my years because uh, the he he, he was Carita must have been a really wonderful musician, and also he played a uh, harpsichord by himself in the by the conducting for example for Saint Martin Passion without seeing any scores. That is a really amazing thing. But anyway, that's uh, his way of uh, music making is the uh, well completely modern. Not only modern, but uh, the um, kind of uh, the, the kind of uh, the machine gun like uh, the the t- note by note. And so, and so that is really not acceptable anymore. But at that time, that that made probably a lot of excitement for the audience, and uh, that's very nice i think 
Do you think there are any older recordings of Bach, say of the B minor mass or the Passions, that have held up? Before the Dutch movement for original instruments. Yeah, well, um, I uh, listened to the, for example, uh, the Mengelberg, Saint, Saint Matthew Passion, a couple of times, just as an example. That's a very famous example in history. And uh, I think, yeah, well, that is, of course, completely different, but uh, probably at that time, uh, it was a very beautiful performance, I think. And the, that is quite romantic, tempo is completely slow, uh, but, uh, well, I have no idea how it was accepted, but actually it um, did work out at that time. So, the, that, this kind of you know sense of value about the performance is changing all the time. So I think uh, we belong to the quite different generation, but the, at that time it um, must have been very right for me. and the, the very the stimulating the to do the Bach music. And how was it you decided to study early music in the Netherlands? Was it just you wanted to study music and then you learn of the movement? Or you went there because of the movement? No, no. Actually, in this way, this, I was completely fascinated by the organ itself. So that's why I started to play organ and I got the lessons when I was a teenager before the university time. And uh, uh, and then uh, I wanted to study more organ. And uh, my first organ teacher was a Belgian priest, actually, in Osaka. In, in, and uh, he, the, I wanted, uh, I, I told him that uh, I wanted to be an organist. And so, the, but, but listen, Masaki, that's, uh, there is no good organ in Japan <laughs> at all. So that is no good idea to study to organ here in Japan. So why don't you start to uh, study compo- composition? So the, the, so I did uh, the study composition. And in the university, that was very good. Uh, the career, very good process to understand the music, and then in between, I just uh, happened to meet uh, the harpsichordist called uh, Motoko Nabeshima, Japanese. Uh, the kind of first generation harpsichordist who studied with Gustav Leonhardt in Amsterdam. And uh, she was a really genius person. She spoke uh, more than six languages in Europe and uh, she has spent quite a long time in Europe. And uh, she came back to Japan and I met her and uh, and uh, I got a lesson from her. And uh, and that was really the the kind of uh, how do you call it uh, the really uh, the ch- changed my life. And uh, she introduced me to uh, Tom Kaufman, who was the schoolmates of her. So the, they were together in, in Gustav Leonhardt's class. So I went to Amsterdam and uh, I went to the Tom Kaufman's concert on the day of my arrival, and that was really shocking. Wow, that was really. So fresh and so exciting on the, the, so I decided to come to the Amsterdam and, uh, that was very, yeah, very good decision, I thought. So if you started with the organ, harpsichord, how was it then you came to conducting? Conducting is actually, um, has been always outside of my idea because, uh, you know, when you, perform cantatas or whatever Bach's ensemble music, you know, someone must lead the, the very possible from the harpsichord as the Bach did and so on. So I did in that way. So gradually I made some ensemble with my brother and my brother's colleague, the, uh, and the string players and so on. And then we were simply started, you know, to to perform uh, the cantatas one by one. And uh, and I, for example, I gave them some sign or some signature. So my brother criticized all the time. Oh, that is not clear. That is not clear. How the what, Which tempo do you want? And something like that. <laughs> and so they threw only for sort of this kind of discussion, you know, this, uh, I became a conductor. <laughs> that is, uh, I'm not the conductor. Well, you, you, yeah, in a uh, in, uh, uh, really traditional sense. <laughs> And were people telling you, well, you can only do one thing. It's organ, harpsichord, or conducting. You have to choose one. Or everyone just let you do all Actually, of those. Actually, these three are completely, I think that is integrated. They're easily integrated. Oh, they, but just, you do they, all three, right? 
Yeah, well, yeah, but the harpsichord organ is, for example, just a completely different instrument, but still based on the same idea how to make music. And also conducting, choir conducting especially, you know, well, there's exactly the same feeling as you uh, play the fuga on organ. For example, theme comes now tenor, now soprano, and something like that. So that's exactly the same. So only thing the choir has a text, so that's much more, you know, uh, better than the organ, I think. <laughs> Given how much music you've produced and how consistent the quality is, what is it you think you know about productivity that other people do not? Well, I, I have no idea about other people's, but the, well, productivity, uh, well, that is uh, only... Well, the Bach's music is so fascinating, so I can't stop working, <laughs> simply. So, well, well, yeah, yeah, well, I, I never try to be productive <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> Just uh, the uh, only I want to pursue the how to improve our performance, how to re uh, the, the realize this and that, uh, the music of Bach, and not only Bach, but the, uh, so, that is only music is there, so nothing else. If you had to explain what is it about the music of Bach that you still do not understand, what would that be? Uh, well, Bach's music is, has always, together with some kind of puzzles and the enigma, so that you can never get an answer to so all the all the uh, that kind of unknown aspects of the Bach. For example, Kunstia uh, Fuga, for example, the Art of Fugue, for example, he, uh, we don't know why he has uh, really written or why what kind of situation it was not finished and uh, and in the cantatas, for example, there are plenty of uh, uh, very difficult places uh, to to understand why he did in this this way and so on and the most of the cases we can find some answers from the text but uh, the still uh, it is not so easy to understand everything and that was very good so how good a sense of the grasp of Bach's mind do you feel you have? Or is he just a complete mystery to you? Yeah, quite quite much mysterious field, I think. So I'm trying to understand, and I'm trying to come closer to Bach's uh, sense or Bach's uh, uh, mind. But actually, it is very very difficult. The 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 more you work, the 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 more distant you can get. <laughs> that is really um, yes, that's true. Yeah. When you're hiring for the Bach Collegium Japan, of course they have to be wonderful musicians, but given the extreme productivity demands that will be placed on them, what is it you look for in the people you hire? Well, the most important uh, aspect uh, from musicians is probably how much they can devote to the music. Um, and, and sometimes uh, how much interest do they have in that music and so well I do for example uh, singers auditions very often and uh, well of course I can I, I have to judge sometimes you know technical aspects of course uh, how how good or the technical but not only the techniques the most important thing is probably their interest and their well, how how much they can devote themselves to to music and uh, so um yeah and uh, yes that that is the most important thing so i i i'm very happy to have uh, now the, our members and orchestra and singers and they uh but they at the very beginning they didn't have any idea what is the Bach's cantata, especially, and then the choir, the choral music, or the, the this kind of ensemble music. How to do that? But the in between during our our working together, they have developed a lot. So that was very nice, and they uh, inspired me again. So this kind of vice versa, uh, the the inspiration is very very nice. Do you think Japanese players understand Bach differently? I don't think so, but only thing is the basically Japanese people don't have any Christian background or tradition in the country. So um, I 
sometimes I have to explain what the text says and so on, and also this and that text comes from this and that text of the Bible and so on. But the, this kind of explanation is not possible in Europe, for example, because everything is already taken for granted. So that's no one can really explain about the Jesus parables. <laughs> and so in Japan, it's, uh, I think it is very good to, to have that kind of a chance, you know, to, to talk about that things. And, uh, and also the uh, German text is, of course, uh, basically impossible in Japan to understand uh, the, immediately. But that's why we need the uh, translations. All the, we provide all the time Japanese translations to audience and all, also for, for the orchestra people, all, all the musicians. And, uh, um, but uh, this kind of a translation work is the part of inter in very important interpretation work because, uh, you know, we read the Bible, for example, uh, the only through the translations. No one in this world, you know, reads the original language in the Old Testament, no New Testament. So, uh, uh, so actually, in order to make uh, some, th this kind of translations, you know, we have to think on that, uh, consider what it mean, really means and so on all the time. So I try to make uh, quite some translations of Bach's cantata, some 20, 30 cantatas I have translated myself, myself but uh, the, it's, it's a very time consuming. That's why <laughs> I gave up the recently, but uh, the, uh, but we have very good colleague to make uh, to good translation. So, with your Japanese background, do you think you approach Christianity differently? Uh, I think so, quite different from any other. Well, actually, the, each of the countries have different traditional, different approach to the Christianity or whatever religion. I think, uh, but in Japan, is a quite different from Korea, for example. In Korea, there's much more Christians now. The, it is said that 40 or 50 percent of the population is Christian, but in Japan, it always says that uh, the only one percent of the something. But in spite of that, the Christian culture is very well known in Japan, so everyone knows what Christmas is, and uh, even Easter, they did quite known nowadays. And uh, uh, But uh, there's very uh, not so many Christians in Japan, and uh, I thought formerly that that is a big, big uh, the negative aspect. But uh, I think that the um, uh, it is not possible really to count who is a Christian, who is not Christian, <laughs> and uh, you know the, when we perform the Saint Matthew Passion regularly and on the uh, Holy Week and every year with since 20 years we, we are doing and for now the more than uh, the, we, we uh, have regularly three performance at the in Holy Week in the same same venue so the something like uh, 5,000, 6,000 people are coming for, for that performance and that is a uh, that is an amazing thing in, in comparison with the number of the Christianity in, in, in Japan. So actually, uh, I think that quite many people can appreciate of the, that kind of message from the Bible as well, not only the Bach's music, but from Bible and so on. So that is my hope. Do you ever think back on what is called the Christian century in Japan, which ends, I think, in 1639, when a lot of Japanese convert to Christianity fairly rapidly, but then Christianity is suppressed. Is there some alternate history where Japan becomes more or less a Christian country, or could that never have happened? No, that has never happened. That has completely stopped, I think, the tradition-wise. But it is very interesting that the, there are quite pl uh, quite many the evidence that uh, before the 1639, uh, the uh, the quite many churches uh, were built by the, com uh, the missionaries and from from Europe, and also uh, the in uh, in Azuchi, for example, where the Oda Nobunaga has a base, uh, the, the very close to Kyoto, um, that was quite many churches and also quite some organs at the time. So 
<clears throat> and also boys missionaries were sent uh, twice at least from Japan to the Pope in, in Rome. And in, in between, uh, at that time, it took a couple of years, you know, to reach the, the Europe. And uh, in between, uh, the some of them practiced the organ on the ship. And then uh, when they uh, arrived at Evora in the, uh, to Portugal, uh, the one of them uh, could play organ immediately, and everyone was astonished. <laughs> <laughs> But in this uh, this kind of connection was completely stopped afterwards. That was a very pity, and the Christianity was actually uh, left over only as the hidden Christian. So that is a very interesting history. But uh, the, the probably it is not possible to 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 call them Christianity anymore. That but that is a kind of mix up with Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So the. Well, recently passed away the musicologist, uh, mi uh, Mr. Minagawa, T Tatsu Minagawa, does, who has uh, researched about that history and uh, found out a very interesting thing. Like, uh, for example, uh, there are still hidden Christians in Japan, in, in Kyushu area. Right. Yeah. And uh, I heard that they have... Or they used to have the, the funeral ceremony... Uh, uh, Combined with the Buddhism and Christianity, so the there are the kind of uh, double uh, uh, how do you call it um, the qu quite big houses or temple like uh, buildings, and the, in the in the front side they are uh, they do the funeral ceremony according to the Buddhism Buddhistish way, and then in in between uh, the priests are supposed to uh, walk around back to the building and then the while walking they are always murmuring this is not true this is not true this is not <laughs> true and then come back to the buddhism again something like that so this is a really interesting ceremony so there's a kind of mixture <laughs> with the christians <laughs> and uh, so this this kind of hidden christianity or the christian people uh, had a very very difficult and miserable uh, history because uh, they they were completely depressed and also they tortured many people and uh, uh, but still they have survived in, in a way so that's but not really anymore as a christian the proper christian uh, well i i don't know exactly well i can't I can't tell too much about that, but uh, because I don't know exactly. But uh, the anyway, that's a hidden Christianity is still there. That's a very interesting thing. And you're from Kobe, right? That was yeah. originally a Christian center along with Nagasaki. Exactly, exactly. Because they were port cities. Yeah. Is that why? Yeah, that is a uh, Kobe is one of the most important. The, after after the reopening of the Japan, so mm -hmm. 1868, uh, they uh, there are probably two Kobe and the Yokohama. Uh, and even Sendai, those uh, the port places, you know, this uh, the very important to accept uh, the any kind of uh, culture from outside. Uh, but uh, the Christianity came in, and uh, and for example, there is the oldest uh, Protestant ch uh, the Protestant church is in in Yokohama. So uh, that is that is the end of nineteenth century. That's a really interesting history. How do Japanese audiences for classical music, say in Tokyo, differ from New York audiences? Well, mm, probably a little different. Um, American audience uh, are more friendly, I think. <laughs> <laughs> more friendly and more uh, easier to to excite to to be excited by the performance and uh, uh, as if they look like uh, more in inspired directly from the music or and also musicians and in Japan Japanese and <clears throat> audiences well, they sometimes they uh, they know very well about uh, the, the repertory and <clears throat> and the very cooperative but uh, they, at the same time uh, the uh, <clears throat> a little bit uh, well not not so uh, excited immediately. Probably the, the, the inside is very excited, <laughs> but uh, well, we Japanese people don't express directly from in, the from inside to outside. That, that is, uh, we all uh, we we were all told in the school, for example, that is the rule. That that is uh, is not the intellectual demeanor, <laughs> something like that.
What do you think of the hypothesis that Japanese audiences, they have a special interest in iconic works, such as Beethoven's Ninth, hmm. and there's a, an insistence that they hear the best or experience the best and single out very particular things. Do you yeah. think that's true? Yeah, Beethoven Ninth is a very special being, yeah, and in, especially in December. And uh, so there are more than 100 performances in Beethoven Nine only in December. So, and the chorus at the end has special meaning for uh, Japanese people, do you think? Chorus? The chorus, the, uh, the lyrics to the choral yeah, yeah, ending yeah. of the Ninth. Yeah, that's, of course, that is very special meaning not only for japan but the i think that's the musically the very big events and but in japan uh there are quite some of uh, uh the uh, projects who uh gather the people more than ten thousand people to sing out to the uh the, the bit of the nine at the end so that is quite uh beloved or <laughs> event but that is no more <laughs> musical event i don't I don't think so. Why do you think Bach's larger vocal works were neglected for as long as they were until Mendelssohn, right? In what, the 1820s? They're a bit forgotten. The keyboard music is not forgotten. Mm. W what happened there? Well, I don't know. There are a couple of different aspects. Uh, for example, um, <clears throat> the, for the passion music of Bach, uh, the St. Matthew or St. John, you need definitely a uh, continual playing, for example. But that idea was already distinct, uh, already uh, completely extinct um, by by the time of uh, Mendelssohn. So Mendelssohn has uh, uh, reformed or the the how you call it the, the made, made a harmonization on the comp uh, the on, for the continual part. He has uh, performed some uh, cantatas as well. But he always provided the uh, the parts for the brass section or the any wind section to fulfill the harmonization on the continuum. So that uh, the improvisation, imp improvisative uh, the parts of the continuum can uh, could not understood anymore uh, by the time of Mendelssohn, and also <clears throat> uh, the. Uh, the, it was much easier for them to understand the passion music just as uh, 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 the storytelling. So, so that Mendelssohn has, uh, has performed the Sintamashi Passion only, uh, mainly uh, the older recitatives. So he avoided, for his first performance, he avoided uh, the nearly all the arias, even Aus Liebe, that he didn't perform mm -hmm. at the first time. And uh, and he, uh, his intention was uh, to, to follow the story as directly as possible. So in that way, uh, uh, the probably it uh, was thought uh, just like uh, the opera uh, production. So, um, so it uh, so the Mendelssohn was uh, the, indeed that has revived the Saint Matthew Passion, and but actually that performance is completely different what we are now doing. How many times do you think Bach heard his own larger scale masterworks, Saint Matthew's uh, Passion, B minor Mass? Uh, he, no, there is no evidence that he has any, any performed the B minor mass. So that he never heard it. He never played. heard it. He never heard Only it. Only in his mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Saint Matthew Passion, he has performed at least uh, the three times. Uh, I think the, the Saint John is four four times or five. I'm, I'm not uh, sure, but uh, anyway, that's the only couple of times he has uh, really hard and performed uh, the, his his own masterworks. Now, your your music is largely online. Not all of our listeners are experts in the music of Bach, but if you had to recommend two or three cantatas that you've conducted, for, a place for them to start, where would you send them? That is very difficult. One of the most difficult <laughs> questions. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> that depends on the situation, what... Uh, you you have uh, the exp in in the past in the experience sure. and yeah of course but the from my side the uh, one of the my favorite cantata is uh, for example um, ah let me let me see Wachtetaufti yeah Wachtetaufti one forty yeah one forty that's a good that one very, that's a very very good one of course and uh, ein Festeburg. Eighty is uh, to Well, I don't recommend that as for the first beginner <laughs> because that is too complicated. And uh, 
And uh, well, uh, for example, uh, count out the number eight, leaps the yezu, di la di la la, um, ba la di la la, that is a really wonderful music. So that's a, you can really use it as a BGM background music as well. And that is really comfortable to listen. And uh, or the uh, count out the one, oh, Two, this, uh, the Herr Deine Augen sehen, Deine Glauben. That is, uh, uh, one or two is the, that's a very interesting structure. The, uh, the choir has a two, uh, double fuga. And that is a really interesting structure. And also the aria was very dramatic. So, uh, or, uh, well, otherwise, pl- plenty of examples. <laughs> In the world today, how many top-tier organs are there for playing the music of Bach, where you can really do it justice? Uh, you said well, there were no good organs in Japan, or you were told this. Uh, at that time, yes, yes. How many organs of the highest quality are there in the whole world for you in to play Bach? In the whole world? Yeah, how many? <laughs> That's a really <laughs> difficult question, but it, was, it totally depends on what you think beautiful or what you feel good. Uh, because the I prefer personally the historical organs, hist- historical the original organs, like sure. in the northern Germany or France or wherever. And uh, <clears throat> well, my f- really favorite organ in the world is the Groningen. That is a Martini Kirk. That is a built by the Johann Kaspar Schnitger. And where is that exactly? The Hron- Groningen is in the north part of oh, the Groningen. Yes, yes. Groningen, yeah, sure. Groningen, yes, mm-hmm. yes. And uh, that is really uh, wonderfully restored. So that is quite much depends on how it's restored as well. Because the organ is, had always very long history. So in between, for example, in the 19th centuries, the all, all of the historical organs uh, were once uh, uh, re- renovated and, uh, according to the musical taste of the that time. So that's uh, all the nearly all the organs were the once romantized completely, romantic, romantic way that uh, they changed. So the in 20th century, the most of uh, the organs uh, were re re renovated to uh, to 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 uh, bring them back to the original situation or 18th century or 17th century and so the, uh, how to restore is a really key point actually so for example this uh, martini kirk in Groningen organ that is the 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 that is originated the shunichika organ so the original from from the very original style is a very very good but the that is beautifully restored by Jürgen Arendt, one of the most important organ builder in Germany. And mm. how was it that organs improved in the time of Baroque music and Bach so that he could do what he did? Because it wouldn't have been possible a hundred years earlier, right? Uh, yeah, the organ, uh, so organ, the organ building have been all the time so changing according to the time. And so Bach's time, the second half of the uh, so 18th century, this, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, it, it, it is, the organs around Bach's area, so Sachsen and Thuringen, have a quite different character from North, North and Germany or Italy or France and so on. And they had a quite many a stringy stops, registers, stringy sound, to quite uh, with a, contains a lot of uh, high overtones. And uh, that is very uh, close to the string instruments. And uh, that is very, very interesting. So that kind of character is uh, very important for the Bach's organ music i think mm-hmm. basically and uh, but the bach as i said there is no organ extant from that time uh, the, to play all the bach's organ music on one instrument so uh, uh actually bach's idea of composition is always uh, surpass of the <laughs> organ <laughs> situation <laughs> here's a question from a reader quote how does he explain the, to me, surprisingly large number of Japanese organ students at top conservatories in Europe? 
uh, now there's so many, not so many peop- Japanese. Not so many, you know. think? Yeah. Yeah. Now much more Korean n o g o n i s t Korean. <laughs> Korean. <laughs> yeah, well, basically, uh, I think in, nowadays in Europe, much less numbers of Japanese students, at, at the, in, 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 in generally speaking. And, but to the, for the, for, Such a, you know, there's a famous conservatory like Paris or Rome or Vienna and so on. There are still quite, quite some, I think, but the much less than before. And that was probably because、uh, the all the Japanese musicians can get a job now in Japan.、Mm-hmm. So they don't have to really go to the Europe <laughs> anymore the, in, in terms of the getting a job. But、uh, I think it's still very important to、uh, go. Go or to, to live in Europe once uh, uh, if you、uh, would like to be, to, to be uh, the uh, musician of the European music. So it is very important, I think. Once you arrived in the Netherlands, of course, you've been to Germany many times earlier on. How did that change how you understood the music of Bach? Uh, well, before I came to the Netherlands, actually, I didn't have any knowledge. I didn't have any understanding of it. <laughs> so the, only the, the feeling. And I loved organ and I loved harpsichord. And, uh, um, but the only thing is the, when, I, when I started learning with, with Tom Kopman, you know,、yeah. what I had、uh, done in Japan was not wrong. So that's, I thought that was,、uh, I was really lucky, I thought. And,、uh, But,、uh, so firstly, uh, well, the, the, well uh, the, uh, actually, I, I was uh, uh, completely ignorant before, before I came to the Netherlands about Baroque music or about Bach and whatsoever. And the, so the, everything was so new to me. So the, all the knowledge. Tom k o p m a n had、uh, so many books and <laughs> so much knowledge. And、uh, he really,、uh, you know, Talked many things like machine guns, so many. <laughs> and、uh, well, t h i s、uh, but the after that, um, well, the, I learned and read some books and so on a, a little bit more objectively. Then, um, uh, I became to the conclusion that I,、uh, I, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I can <laughs> stay myself, you know, something like that. But if you go to the Bach church in Leipzig or go to Arnstadt,、mm. mentally, emotionally, does something fall into place or do you just look at it and say, oh, that's nice? Well, um, The, for example, in St. Thomas Church in, in Leipzig, uh, the, uh, I was very happy to be there the,、uh, for the first time ever. That was still DDR site, DDR、mm-hmm. time. And uh, uh, it was really uh, the. Uh, the Uh, in, in front of the church, there was a huge statue of the Bach, and that was, <laughs> oh, Bach was so big, <laughs> person and something. But actually, the, the, the St. Thomas Church itself is the,、um, well, now that's quite, I heard that, that, that is the, the inside is quite different from the time of the Bach, and the, the uh, well, I was very happy to be there, but not really, You know, see,、uh, how do you call it? The, I, I can't make any, any connection from the, the、uh, heaven through that church, you know. That's, so, anyway, that's,、um, the Bach can be anywhere. I think I thought that the Bach can be anywhere in, in, in the world. So, that is very important places. And, but now,、uh, it's quite different in the building wise, structure wise, and、uh, the, everything is、uh, different. So,、uh, you can never feel the, Original atmosphere there. What do you think of Glenn Gould's highly unusual interpretations of Bach? Well, the Glenn Gould, I love the Glenn Gould performance very much. And the,、uh, that, that is n- not, not so unusual. That's、uh, if you try to. Um, to make articulations and also to make、uh, the, some kind of effects、uh, like、uh, the harpsichord and or organ and so on. The, the, it, it, I thought that was quite a natural conclusion that he did in that way. And, uh, uh, like, uh,、mm, and, uh, the, the, there's one or, one or two, the recording of, 
organ playing, his organ playing. That was a little strange, I think. <laughs> but piano, the, for example, Goldberg variation, that's a really fabulous recording, I think. What do you think of the view that some of them are wonderful, like the partitas, the English suite in A minor, but say the well-tempered clavier, it just seems like swooning and the tempos are too arbitrary, it's not charming to me, or... Oh, uh, really? Uh, some of them seem to not work at all. Mm, yeah, could be. I, I don't know so many different recordings, but the uh, at least for the Glenn, uh, the Goldberg variations, uh, the, that was very nice, first one especially, yeah. And sometimes uh, the tempo is very quick, and uh, I, can't, I can't do that in that way, but uh, that, uh, that was a very fascinating performance, I think. The Brandenburg Concerti, what is it exactly that makes them such a major advance over the music that came before? Because they seem to come out of nowhere, and they're so fully blown. The solos are incredible, right? The mm. ensemble work. Yes. Um, I think that was uh, the Bach's intention to compile the, the six concertos as a one collection, but probably the, by then he has composed quite many concertos. We, the, and uh, uh, I think that is very simple. Called the you know the the New Yorker Bach specialist uh, Michael Morrison has written about that Brandenburg Concerto that was a symbolized uh, symbol. Uh, the, he he his intention was to uh, represent the the uh, social hierarchy. Uh, to the well, number one con, con, uh, Brandenburg number one is the with two horns. That is very uh, you know the usual symbol for the court, or the dignity of the court, and then. Second one is the, the uh, trumpet solo, oboe, recorder, and violin. Those four instruments are uh, supposed to be performed by the, any uh, Stadtpfeiffer. So they had to uh, the, the master all these instruments and so on and so on. And the number three is very interesting because the, the number three is uh, this number was made by Bach himself and uh, that is three violins, three viola, three celli. So that's everything dominated by three. But uh, the, the, he didn't compose a second movement. So that is uh, actually movement was supposed also three, but the second one is missing and only one bar in the middle of the page so he clearly intended to uh, uh, to uh, for, for him by self, by himself to improvise that uh, the second movement so the that was uh, the intention for the bearing uh, the, um, the, uh, the 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 kind of the uh, how do you call it recruit um, uh, the he he intended he he wanted to uh, to to dedicate to the Berliner uh, the, the, um, uh, the graph and the and then if you hire me then I can improvise for this movement and <laughs> something like that. What is it in contemporary classical music that you enjoy? Contemporary music. Well, yes, I enjoy sometimes, uh, but. Uh, Probably there are plenty of other specialists for that kind of contemporary music, I think. But, uh, but what do you listen to? Uh, well, the, I don't know what is the contemporary, but uh, the probably I, I listen to the Stravinsky, for example. That's mm -hmm. one of the, my favorite composer. And I did actually, I made even one CD of the Pruchinella and so on. And, uh, uh, the even even more recent one like uh, Takemitsu and uh, that is very beautiful. Um, so, but sometimes I can't um, understand what their intention. So sometimes are very difficult. Uh, uh, very recently. I, I was, I used to be the, uh, the student in, for the composition. And yes. at that time, my teacher was uh, Akio Yashiro, uh, who has studied in Paris. And he has passed away when he was uh, the 46 years old. That really, while uh, still I was a student at that time. Uh, but he has uh, composed a wonderful symphony and the piano concerti and so on. And uh, very recently, I have uh, performed his symphony for the first time in my life and with the Sapporo Symphony Orchestra. And uh, that was great, uh, great pleasure. And this is a rhythm called so interesting. And uh, so the structure is quite classical. So his way of composing was, uh, uh, in a way, conservative. Um, 
the according to the very classical structure and also rhythm pattern and so on and they but the sound itself is completely co uh, well new the i mean atonal uh, music so it was a little difficult for me to to enjoy or that kind of sound so but the it was wonderful uh well wonderful experience what is it you like in popular music popular music uh i uh, Uh, again, as I don't know what uh, the uh, how, how what kind of definition of the popular music, <laughs> but uh, the um, well, I like uh, some uh, the, uh, the s s songs, uh, sing uh, singers like uh, yeah, Mariah Kelly, for example, and uh, also the uh, Whitney Houston and so on. Those <laughs> things <laughs> that's a uh, uh, really wonderful music, and uh, so they are really good, you know. To they're the singers, and also so. Uh, kind of uh, the, uh, the 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 texts are also v very uh, kind of to to how how to to cheer up the people, and that was very positive aspect all the time. So that was very very nice. And the, sometimes in Japanese uh, the popular music uh, uh, is a we. Um, Uh, we call them the some the, uh, one of the tradition traditional Japanese popular music called enka. Enka means uh, that is uh, the songs for the uh, uh, remorse and also the sometimes regrets and so on. Sometimes the all the time uh, the very often Japanese uh, popular songs have uh, that kind of. Texts which describe the negative aspects of our, <laughs> our experience. I find it a little dif uh, difficult, not difficult, I'm mean, a little pity. Mm. What's your favorite Beatles song? The Beatles. Beatles. Yeah, Beatles. Beatles. Uh, <laughs> I don't know much about that. <laughs> yeah, that's Beatles. Really, I don't know. But uh, the I. When I was a brass band, you know, that's, <laughs> we played some Beatles arrangement for brass band, and that yeah. was the that was uh, for, for Yellow Submarine, and, uh -huh. <laughs> and, and uh, oh yeah, one of uh, one of the Beatles songs which was the higher the very top, uh, the piccolo trumpet was the as a feature. Penny Lane, right? Penny Lane, yeah, yes, exactly. That's very exactly. good. That was my, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> But, <laughs> When you're conducting and recording, what is it you're thinking about? Do you have to concentrate completely on the music, or does your mind wander at all? Or how no, is that for you? No, not at all. Not at all. I, I, well, I'm, basically, I can't think anything other than other than music. Then what is or happening? The, or the, yeah, that happened, or, or in that bar. <laughs> and so even I can't think of the next bar. The, so the only thing that the, the I always concentrate in what coming next what coming next something like that and the the and also the um, the purpose or aim of, of that that part of the music so you know what kind of atmosphere must be realized and so on this that is most important things and you're never distracted by physical troubles like i'm tired of standing or anything all uh Well, no, actually, no distraction. Only for the rehearsals, you know, when uh, I start rehearsal, sometimes I feel, ah, today is, I'm very tired. But but during the rehearsal, I always freshed up. So that's uh, no problem anymore. That's uh, the, during the, 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 big, big, the, because of the music, you know, I always, uh, uh, I can get uh, energy from that. And uh, How much do you need a score to conduct? How much? Well, some people conduct without a score. It's oh, yeah, much yes. harder. Do you need a score or you use a score? You don't. Oh, yeah, of course. Definitely. I always use the score. I never, never do the anything by, by heart because that is not necessary. And uh, it just takes up more brain power. For no purpose. No, or? actually, the you know, the for pianists or violinists or song uh, singers, for example, they uh, they maybe they must uh, memorize all the texts or whatever. Mm -hmm. And for pianists, uh, they most of the pianists are too busy, you know, to to see the score. <laughs> so that uh, they, of course, must uh, memorize everything. But for conductors, uh, no reason to to memorize actually. So just like uh, uh, Anselme said, you know, and uh, I think uh, the. 
Uh, and also choir, choir people in the, of the sacred music, not not in the opera scene or whatsoever, but uh, they must keep the scores always in hand because, uh, you know, there's by by memorization, you know, that's uh, the the your memory, uh, your the, the music, um, I have to call it, your understanding of the music uh, are changing all the time because uh, you know that to to. Um, to to realize this and that notes and the texts and so on this without mistakes and so on then you must uh, take different energy to keep up that but what we should do is only to make a music to make a sound so i think uh, the other than the opera's uh, uh, scenery performances uh, the i think it is better to have uh, scores all the time do you just go back and listen to your old recordings for fun or it's finished, you're done, and you move on to the next thing. Yeah, basically, I want always to move on to the next <laughs> and never, never look back. But uh, <laughs> sometimes I was told to do that because I have to choose the, the content of this and that thing to make another program or this is like a rec- to make a recommendation of the content and, and so on. But uh, the, basically, I don't uh, look back at all. <laughs> but you have, say, at least two recordings of St. Matthew's Passion. I think mm. they're about 10 years apart. Yeah. So when you did the second, was your feeling, I just want to do something different? Or you had heard the first and you thought, no, that's wrong. I need to correct it. No, or, no, no, no. They're no, just that's, different visions. Uh, that was only, um, you know, each CD, each recording, uh, never, never, none of them was really perfect. So I I always want to do once again, like the live, live performance. So if I have a time, you know, I, I'd like to do the all, all the cantatas once again. But uh, the... Then the after all, then I probably will want to do once again. So that's why there's a never-ending story. But for Saint Matthew Passion, is the first recording was um, the uh, I, I have nothing to regret. But uh, the uh, in between we have the much better. We have improved in in uh, in not only the technically but also the understanding about the Bach and uh, all the members, choir member, orchestra member, have all uh, developed quite much. So that's why um, kind of uh, as a milestone, you know, I think uh, this the very good to do once again. And if I could live another 30 years, and then uh, probably I will do once again. (laughs) You have one of the best-known recordings of Handel's Messiah. But as you know, there's literally hundreds of recordings of the Messiah. Do you you go and listen to some of them before you record to make sure yours is different, or you just figure it will come out different? Do you listen to old ones like Beecham for inspiration, or how do you approach the musical pass? That is the... Uh, sometimes I need, uh, you know, to listen to the others, the uh, recording of the older one or the as a kind of reference. But the, uh, but basically, I don't listen to. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm trying not to listen too much as I was recording. <laughs> that was too much influence, and uh, I think uh, the make recording is a very interesting because uh, that is a quite important uh, experience for all of us, all of our colleagues. And uh, during the recording session, you know, many things happen and uh, not all, they're not always very easy. And so, uh, but during that uh, recording sessions, uh, you know, uh, we all, um, we all take that music into any, uh, uh, cells in our body. <laughs> <laughs> that was really, uh, interesting. And, uh, for example, that the Messiah recording is a long time ago, but uh, the during the recording session, the couple of our uh, colleagues, uh, mother or father or spouse, said they have passed away or something, and also my my wife, the mother, uh, has passed away just. Uh, when when we finished the recording, as if she has waited for that moment, so that kind of memory is always coming back, and uh, so it is really wonderful experience to to keep going with the recording session session recording. That's very nice. As you must know, Apple has recently acquired BIS Records, and you've done so much of your work with them. Will that change how you approach recording projects? Well, actually. We don't know yet what's happening now. So 
uh, well, I, I'm so happy to、uh, to be working with the BIS all the time since 30 years now. And uh, uh, um, so I, I really hope that we can go on in more or less a similar way. And uh, uh, we have a really wonderful connection,、uh, the relationship with、uh, this company. So more I, people might hear your music because Apple will put it higher in the algorithm, right? What, what do you mean? This? The, well, let's say you're listening to music、uh -huh. through Apple services、uh, and you just type in Bach. You don't know what yeah, you want. Yeah. I would think it's more likely that Apple puts you at the front because they own the rights to that music and that more people will hear you. I'm yeah, just guessing. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. That is what,、uh, yeah, yeah. Probably, hopefully, yes.、Yeah. So it could be good <laughs>、yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, that's、uh, very nice. Yeah. So you, you're now at 67 years old and. You first、no. heard Bach when you were 12 years old. That's 55 years of listening to Bach, playing it, conducting it, recording it. Over so many years, how do you think it's affected you emotionally or spiritually or philosophically? How are you different、well, internally? Wow. Well, I'm getting older now. So, <laughs> the, 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 I know Bach is always there. So, yeah, well, I've never thought in that way. The Bach is my life, actually. So,、mm -hmm. you know, so, so familiar. As if、uh, we are, I, I am living inside of the Bach's music. So I can never judge from outside. <laughs> <laughs>、um, so, yeah, well, actually, I, I, it is not the uh, uh, thinkable uh, to. To live without Bach's music or without music. And so、um, that, is, that is my life only. So, last two questions. First, what is your favorite pizza in New Haven? Pizza. Well, to,、uh, well, to perfectly, to be honest,、um, I, I didn't get any pizza. In <laughs> very sorry. It's very good there. Yeah, I know that's very famous. Yeah, but、uh, well,、uh, I I don't like pizza so much.、Ah, I'm、okay. very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Last question: What will you do next? Now, now. Uh, well, uh, after this project with the Yale and Juilliard,、uh, now we are rehearsing of the Handel's Oratorio called the Allegro Pensose et Moderato. That's very interesting music and. Um, but、uh, the after that, uh, the uh, uh, let me see.、Uh, now, next project is、uh, well, a couple of organ concerts in Japan because、uh, the <clears throat> the in Kobe in the Shoin Chapel,、uh, the where we have. Uh, we have made all the CDs recording, and、uh, that organ that's、uh, built by the French organ builder、uh, called、uh, Marc Gardinier, that was exactly 40 years Jubilee this year. So that's why I will give a couple of concerts there. And uh, 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 so that is actually a starting point of my whole career. So that is a really important event. And after that, I'm coming back to,、uh, to, to Europe、uh, to make、uh, another volume、uh, six or seven the, the, of the organ series、uh, in Groningen. And then、uh, I will make a tour with the Orchestra of Age of Enlightenment uh, uh, with the Christmas Oratorio, whole six parts. So that's a really exciting. And the next year, January, we are going to perform Brahms Deutsche Requiem in, with the、uh, period instruments in Japan and to make a recording. That is really exciting. I look forward to that. Masaki、yeah. Suzuki, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.